Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Good morning from New York time zone and good day to you wherever you are in the world. And welcome to this harasses panel on ethics. Uh, first and foremost, uh, I'll introduce myself uh, as the chair and thank uh, Frank Jurgen Richter, uh, chairman executive chairman of Horasis, for actually introducing the idea that we should have a panel on ethics and uh, according me the privilege of chairing it. I'm Lou Marinoff, professor of philosophy at the City College of New York, and we have a very distinguished and insightful panel of philosophers to whom we're going to ask some burning questions about the current situation and uh, hear from them their interesting viewpoints on global ethics and perhaps a bit later in the panel on more local ethics in their respective regions. Uh, I do not have to inform anyone that this pandemic has derailed globalization, has uh, done a lot of damage to people, uh, but has also exacerbated somehow the weaknesses uh, of every possible kind across the stratum. Uh, we have political, economic, social, and psychological issues that have all been somehow worsened in the course of this. And ethics have, I believe, been marginalized. And that's the purpose of our panel today, to ask some questions. We, we seem to, to have ethics being supplanted by metrics, uh, virtue being replaced by virtue signaling, ideas trumped by ideologies. I'm now going to turn to the panelists for their views. What kind of ethics do we need during and post-pandemic? Do we have to retool and reset like everybody else? Or can we revivify more ancient systems and reapply them to our contemporary situation. First, a great honor to introduce my colleague, Professor Balaganapathy Devaraconda, Professor Bala, head of philosophy at the University of Delhi. I'm going to start with you, your uh, chair of philosophy in the, in the world's largest democracy uh, and one that's been very sorely afflicted of late, Bala. So please give us your view. Three minutes, okay? Three Thank minutes. You. Yeah, sure. Uh, thank you, Lou, for making me a part of this event. And I congratulate Horasis for organizing this wonderful platform, providing this wonderful platform for a discussion on uh, can ethics survive pandemic? So what is it that we are doing when, when we raise this question, can ethics survive pandemic? In fact, we are placing ethics in relation to health. Okay, That's the most important point that we have to make note of. We are placing it uh, in relation to health and then looking at whether ethics can survive health, right? So that's the larger, the larger uh, uh, aspect that we have to look at. And my uh, take on this, uh, the board, something that strikingly comes forward because of this pandemic that I see is uh, uh, so far human beings are so engrossed in human activity. So we have given importance only to activity. Because we see without activity, there is no life at all. So life is completely encapsulated in human activity. This is how we have looked at the world so far. But now this pandemic has taught us that, no, it's, it's not the activity that is so important. Along with the activity, something else is also important, which is inactivity. So that has come strikingly saying that you have to give importance to inactivity as well. You recognize you fools, this is what it has told us you know, to the whole uh, global humanity. So that, that is a very important that uh, take that we have to take from this pandemic. And uh, for the first time in the history of human world, we have recognized and we have understood the importance of uh, non-activity or inactivity. When I say inactivity, what I mean is I'm not talking about inactivity of a stone. I'm talking about human inactivity, okay? Uh, where uh, we, we assume that freedom is only in acting and acting in different ways. But we have to understand that freedom is involved in choosing action and inaction as well. No, this, this has two different perspectives that I would like to present. For instance, when we uh, experienced uh, uh, during the lockdown, most of the countries were under lockdown and uh, we, we were asked not to go or not to act in the social sphere and the uh, uh, outside, no public sphere. So this, this like isolation and social distancing, these aspects, what are they they're trying to tell us is uh, limiting of the domain of human action and restricting the community action. You know, these also have become very important aspects of ethical perspective of humanity. So this is the take that we have to uh, uh, take from uh, the present pandemic. The second important aspect, I'll just conclude with this aspect because this is very important. Uh, this inactivity 
is uh, it's it's not complete inactivity it is a pause in the activity because pause in the activity is very rejuvenating when you sleep right you you are pausing your activity and this creates a kind of uh, uh, a rejuvenating experience to you and you would be able to perform better act better later on so this pause is very important and this is understood with the help of this can be understood with the help of natural organisms as well for instance there is something called autophagy you no know, autophagy is the smallest thing living thing is cell and cell it tries to uh, rejuvenate itself when you when you don't feed it further it tries to eat its own damaged parts and try to rejuvenate itself so which means the nature has this capacity of rejuvenating itself through the inactivity and this is what i would offer as the opening statement to all of you to ponder upon thank you so much thank you very much bella that's a very interesting we will see if the social organism can learn to mimic the natural organism but you've also alluded to the difference between the path of action and the path of inaction i know you're alluding to bhagavad gita and i'll ask you to expound on that a little bit later in the next round because you seem to be intimating that ancient indian philosophy can serve us very well in this time of forced inactivity so thank you so much for those remarks i would like now uh, to turn to uh, Veronica Johansson, founder of Udemon at Sweden, a professional ethicist and also a director of the Swedish Society for Philosophical Practice. Veronica, please give us your opening view. Thank you, Lou. Um, well, I would just start with a question. Is the business of business still business? Um maximizing short term shareholder value is no longer a given and all these major scandals exemplified for instance by enron or volkswagen basically reiterates the need for ethics in business also we live in urgent times in need of urgent solutions to global challenges such as climate change and excessive consumerism and these challenges are addressed in the UN's SDGs um as a road map to a more sustainable future and in addition to all of this we do have the pandemic which poses i would claim unprecedented challenges both to businesses to nations and to our everyday lives so to my mind the pandemic has magnified both ethical and existential issues bringing these questions much closer to home for everyone and not only for us philosophers so personally i'm quite convinced that ethics will survive the pandemic uh but all in all fostering an ethical awareness may be more urgent than ever right now to address the challenges posed both by the pandemic um our vuca world uh, unsustainable businesses and unsustainable personal choices so given this urgency a more relevant and pressing question is what kind of ethics do we need to build a sustainable future So if we limit the question to the corporate world our stakeholder theory the global reporting initiatives codes of conduct purpose driven businesses are, are are these enough um and while i would claim that these initiatives are a good start something crucial still seems to be missing uh we can do the right actions for the wrong reasons and if so we're basically producing a temporary behavioral change but we fail to foster an ethical mindset and even worse sometimes a corporation's code of conduct or their values it's nothing but greenwashing or evoked virtue signaling so if we want to create a sustainable future words must be turned into actions through implementing an ethical awareness at all levels of an organization So how is this done? I call for a collaboration between philosophers and organizations with the fine tune our personal moral compasses. Walking the talk is not a one time affair though. It requires taking moral action again and again. So basically 
Um, repeated actions turns into habits, and as Aristotle remarks, these habits build virtues and moral character, which in turn turns into organizational cultures well equipped to help solving the challenges of our time and foster a shared humanity. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed, Veronica. That was a very well elaborated. You packed a lot into three minutes. And I personally, and from my experience uh, with global organizations, agree with you. You know, the MDGs were morphed into the SDGs because some of them were unattainable uh, and they had to take a different route. Some of them um, have been dropped by the wayside. As you ably pointed out, there was a lot of talk about compassionate capitalism and corporate social responsibility a couple of decades ago. That kind of fell by the wayside and I think COVID has pretty much buried it. But we need something real. And what you're suggesting, and I know that we're going to have another panelist also thump on this one, uh, full, uh, that corporations need to have um, a CPO, a chief philosophy officer, in addition to what else they have. They need a moral philosopher in the boardroom. Otherwise, it's only going to be lip service and it's only going to feed the distrust of governments and of, co of corporations that unfortunately COVID has exacerbated. That's enough speechifying for me, but I, I wish we had more time to hear your views, Veronica, and how to actually cash this out in the real world. But thank you very much. And without further ado, we're going to move now from Northern Europe, Scandinavia, to a very charming corner of, uh, of uh, Eastern Europe, and that is Portugal and our uh, able colleague Nuno Venturino, a veteran of, of many Horasis meetings and a professor of philosophy at Nova University. So please uh, give us your opening remarks, Nuno. Well, thanks, Lou, for the introduction and for having me. Well, to the straightforward question of our panel, will ethics survive the pandemic? Uh, I shall give a straightforward answer. Uh, ethics will survive the pandemic. Uh, this isn't the first pandemic mankind has faced, and it won't be the last one for sure. We have faced many other threats before, like Black Death and Spanish flu, which killed millions of people in the 14th and 20th centuries. And there have been wars and natural disasters. But even when there seemed to be no more hope, many people uh, have always been able to distinguish right from good. And this is the core of ethics. Um, so as long as we recognize that we should pursue what is good and avoid what is evil, we won't have to worry about ethics. I'm not saying we will be infallible. We won't. But conscience will prevail and that can lead to virtuous actions. And this is what uh, actually is present throughout the history of philosophy since the time of Aristotle. It's true that Masses of people are losing trust in their governments today and criticizing their decisions. Uh, but when people raise their voices in defense of what they deem to be right, they are appealing to ethical premises. So one of the biggest challenges we have encountered lately uh, is the fair distribution of vaccine supplies. Without equitable allocation of resources, it won't solve a global pandemic perhaps an epidemic, but not a global pandemic. So it's therefore highly important that the richest nations can give compensations to the pharmaceutical companies to waive their patents on COVID-19 vaccines, I think. And only in this way will vaccines reach everyone. Let me give you um, an example or uh, something that happened here in Europe. So the European Union has taken a decision to purchase vaccines jointly instead of each member country doing it. And this has certainly reduced the possibility of unfair distribution in Europe. Of course, that now some countries are purchasing their own uh, supplies, but at least in principle, I think this decision was, was a very good one. And something similar should clearly be done in other regions of the world. Of course, I mean, the European Union is a uh, is composed of um, of many countries, and um, it's difficult to to do this in, in other in other spheres of the globe. But I think that with the help of some um, organizations, this could certainly be done. Thank you. 
Thank you very much. Uh, Nuno, I, I, I may have mistakenly located you in uh, in Eastern Europe, and I hope your government is not panicked about that. You are indeed the westernmost tip, and I've been to the Cape and seen it, so I know it's there. I'm a little bit uh, uh, excited by this panel. The geography is off base. Let's keep the philosophy on point. Uh, you've but done a very nice corner, corner. so... You, you, you've done a very good job, uh, Nuno, of, of being an optimist uh, in the face of so much uh, negativity in, in insisting that our moral consciences will prevail. But surely, and this is going to come up in the next round, moral conscience comes from within, does it? Not just like virtue comes from within. So having ideologies imposed on us or having, uh, you know, uh, news and, and opinion uh, curated by, by big technology platforms is not going to, I don't think, contribute to the inculcation of the moral compass that we need to insist on. So I'm going to challenge you next time to elaborate on how we do this. I fully agree with you that this must happen. But as to the mechanisms, um, that would be more interesting to pursue. All right, let us turn now to the USA. Uh, we're still uh, traveling westward. Uh, I think I have that right now. I'm used to going west to east. So uh, we're traveling now to, to Vaughn, a fury who is a very experienced applied ethicist and, and philosopher, founder uh, and, and president of many associations in her time. Vaughn and I go back uh, a more than a quarter of a century working in philosophical practice areas. Uh, she, she's founded nonprofits. She works with a vast variety of corporations and other organizations in presenting ethical and other philosophical programs. And I know she's thought deeply about this problem. So Vana, will ethics survive the pandemic? Please give us your opening. I think Vana is muted. I'm sorry. Okay, um, I think ethics must survive and will survive. Um, we know um, from long practice that um, if, if we do, we have unethical conduct in business, it leads to unwelcome regulation, litigation, bad publicity, and so forth. So um, these are old problems, but we have new challenges because there's always a dialectical interplay between ethical theory and ethical practice. And we are practicing as ethicists on new terrain now um, because of the problems and uh, new problems that have been raised by the pandemic. Um, certainly the pandemic has encouraged the acceleration of uh, digitalization, uh, of science, of uh, technological problems and advances. Uh, and also, uh, as Blue pointed out in the introduction, has been a catalyst for the development and extension of uh, existing social problems. So we have new challenges. So how are we to meet those challenges? One, I think, is obviously through looking at ethical management from the top down in a corporation and from the bottom up. And we need to have uh, new approaches as Victoria and I, I think uh, Tom the other day mentioned, uh, and Bala also, and because uh, the uh, lip service to ethics and compliance training to avoid liability considerations is just not enough. We need a, a much deeper moral commitment, at the very minimum, a moral commitment to the recognition that people have, everyone has equal rights, uh, prima facie rights at least, to autonomy and well being and that those rights need to be respected uh, in the pursuit of pro and within the context of the pursuit of profit. Now, what does that uh, really mean? I think that means that we'll have to retool our conceptions, particularly in the areas of liberty and in the areas of uh, pri liberty and privacy on the one hand and equality and uh, equal uh, equitable distributions on the other. Uh, Nuno has already mentioned the problem of vaccine distribution. Uh, we have uh, on, on the privacy end of it, we have all these problems with uh, cybersecurity and uh, commodification of data and so forth. So uh, those are all areas that we have to, to look at. Um, I think also uh, the pandemic has provided an opportunity for uh, global business to move into new areas. In part, um, there's a breakdown in, of trust in almost every institution uh, in the United States, and, 
but corporations enjoy more trust than government right now, in part because they have done a wonderful job in transforming the workplace and also in uh, rapid uh, production of vaccines. So this provides opportunities for, for a business, but uh, the opportunity to expand into new areas, I think, is going to um, uh, demand an extension and retooling of our conceptions of corporate social responsibility. So I do not think that that uh, conception is dead, but I think we need to um, to uh, retool it. And I think that's all I have to say in the introduction. Thanks so much, Vaughna. Uh, that that's very insightful and. Uh... I must say that I, I rather uh, like your point uh, that liability <laughs> training, uh, you know, protection from from exposure, legal exposure, is a primary concern of, because we have such a litigious culture here in the U.S. And I think that's very much unlike Europe uh, and and Asia. So we need uh, definitely more ethicity in American business. Uh, and of course, concern about liability issues, but with that, the city comes also protections against those things. And once again, uh, it's philosophers who provide this kind of training. Codes of ethics, as wonderfully as they may be crafted, are not self-implementing. And we know from vast experience that you always need someone to go into the workplace and actually do workshops to show people how these codes play out in practice. What does it mean to be ethical in practice? It's not the same thing as reading the code or printing it out and putting it in your file folder. Okay, we'll leave that there for now and uh, introduce uh, Tom Morris, uh, <laughs> professor formerly of Notre Dame, best-selling author of If Aristotle Ran General Motors, among other great books, uh, founder of the Morris Institute for, for, for Human Values. Tom, please share with us your preliminary views on this problem. Will ethics survive the pandemic? Thank you, Lou. Every technological uh, device I own conspired to keep me from being on this panel this morning, but I used the ethical quality of persistence and made it through. Uh, you know, I love it that Plato represented Socrates as going around uh, haranguing people in Athens, saying things like this, man of Athens, you're a citizen of the greatest city in the history of the world. Why is it all you care about is money and fame? You give no attention to the state of your own soul. Well, you know, it turns out Socrates had no problem with money or fame. What he had a problem with was people chasing external results before establishing a foundation in the soul. And to Plato's student Aristotle, ethics was all about the soul. In Aristotle's view and my own, ethics is about human flourishing. It's about becoming better people and building stronger human relations. It's about stronger organizations. It's a form of strength or power that's unique and impossible to replicate in any other way. I think the pandemic, rather than eclipsing ethics, which it looked like it might for a while because of all the divisiveness that was, was generated by this terrible global phenomenon, I think it will emerge stronger as a result. Now, in regard to an appreciation of ethics, there are three kinds of people. First of all, there are those few enlightened people who think of ethics as necessary and and seek to be ethical in all that they do. They also try to associate with like-minded individuals because they understand the nature of ethics. And so it's important for sustainable excellence and human flourishing. Second are the people who think of ethics as nice, but not in any way necessary. They'd often prefer to work with ethical people and themselves most often seek to be ethical because it produces the least amount of trouble. Unless, of course, perceived self-interest in a particular situation suggests otherwise. And third, they're the people who think of ethics as completely unnecessary and superfluous, an artificial constraint that gets in the way of movers and shakers who should be free to move and shake. That's too often the ethos in our modern world. I think the pandemic and all its surrounding uncertainty has helped confirm the first group in its beliefs, the people who think of ethics and trust as necessary for human flourishing and is won over some of the people in the second group who think it's nice, but not necessary. But few in the third group are even paying attention to how anything relates to ethics. So we philosophers have to get out in the streets like Socrates. We have to get out into the corporations. We have to get out into the government structures and tell people that ethics is not a nicety or a redundancy or a superfluity. It's core to any form of sustainable success in the world today. And I think some of the 
backlash from what we've been experiencing, people behaving badly the past year, will help us to inculcate that view of ethics as it should be. So I hope to see ethics come back stronger after having been knocked down for a while. Thank you so much, Tom. Always wonderful to hear you speak on any topic, but especially this one, close as it is to your heart. We are now into the second round. And once again, I'm going to ask you to speak each for three minutes. We'll go back around and then I'm going to, at the end, uh, ask each of you to give us your 30 second takeaway for the you know, for the benefit of the audience. If they're going to remember one thing, they're going to remember that. Bala, back to you. Uh, would you like to uh, comment on anything that any of the other speakers have said? Would you like to elaborate on what you said? Or would you like to do both? Uh, you, the floor is yours for three minutes, please. Yeah, yeah. I almost agree with uh, uh, each of these, uh, each of our colleagues uh, who spoke here. In fact, uh, Tom's point also uh, very strongly he has uh, put it. Uh, I was just looking at like, Whenever there is a crisis, the pandemic is a crisis. So whenever there is a crisis, where do we look for the resources? We obviously look for the resources within us. Okay. So we prove that the resources would be looked outside. No. Resources for the crisis, especially for a human crisis, would be looked within. And that is how ethics becomes a very important aspect because that is uh, ethics is situated and rooted in the individual's concerns itself. So that is that plays a very crucial role in understanding that. And that's where I would like to refer to Indian situation uh, in addressing this pandemic where uh, <clears throat> people try to look at, because when you look at India, you, you, it's not that it's only modern or postmodern or pre-modern. All of them live together. Uh, simultaneously, you would find all three of them or all hundred of them together. So it's, it's a kind of diverse, uh, uh, setup that we live in uh, and uh, in this kind of a situation basically people have understood that we have to get back to the pre-modern or traditional roots of uh, looking at health understanding ethics so that's how they try to build their ethical system and also the health system and that's how we find uh, frequent references we found frequent re references to uh, the traditional uh, medicinal system of India which is uh, Ayurveda Charaka Samhita is the text that was produced by uh, uh, ancient uh, uh, says uh, thousands of years back. So uh, the book is being referred and also Patanjali Yoga Sutra. Okay, Yoga has become so popular all over the world and people started looking at the text and also the practices that were provided along with other meditative and contemplative uh, practices which have moved all around the world. So looking back at the traditional resources is very important in the time of crisis. And this was very well done. And that's where uh, the Lou was referring to Bhagavad Gita. You know, uh, what is the right kind of action in a human crisis? This issue is very well addressed in the form of a distinction that was brought, between, brought uh, by uh, Lord Krishna in Bhagavad Gita in terms of uh, karma, akarma and vikarma. Karma is action and uh, Vikarma is negative action and uh, uh, Karma, Akarma, Akarma is non-action. So he basically argues against non-action, but non-action in, in a different kind of sense. But I was arguing for non-action in fact here. <laughs> I was saying that pandemic in fact asked us to give importance to non-action or inaction on in the domain of uh, uh, human life as well so that that was the point that I was that I was making just to make a, few, a brief point about this Patanjali Yoga Sutra Patanjali Yoga Sutra uh, gives us a, a, a step by step development improvement of looking at uh, uh, the individual growth in terms of uh, eight steps that are provided, which are uh, in terms of yama, niyama, asana, pranayama, pratyahara, dharana, chana, samadhi. I'm not going to elaborate on these things, but what I'm trying to say here is from the individual moral state, the first step is considered to be the moral one and then the biological one and then the meditative one and then the spiritual one. And that is how each of these steps, each of these uh, 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 ladders were stressed so that individual, whoever wants to reach out, uh, reach his, uh, explore his self would be doing it. So that's, that's what I would like to present here from the Indian perspective. Thank you.
Thank you. Thank you very much indeed, uh, Bala. And uh, I mean, I think it's well worth repeating uh, that uh, what we sing here is a convergence of view that the ancient sources, be they Hellenic or be they Indian, or for that matter, be they Buddhist or Taoist, uh, all offer people a very robust remedy to some of the problems posed by the pandemic. So thank you for calling our attention to that. Uh, let's go back now to uh, to uh, Veronica uh, and uh, ask you to uh, elaborate on your earlier points or indeed to comment on anything that the speakers have said and your challenge is to do it in three minutes, please, Veronica. Well, that's usually always a challenge. I think we all philosophers, we like to talk. Um, however, though, I, I find it very interesting now listening to the different points that's been brought to the table. Um, and I think to, to, to a certain extent that, that we can see the ethical questions arise by the pandemic to relate both to the individual uh, to businesses and to nations. So all this, of course, raises different kinds of ethical questions. And considering what Bala said now most recently, I mean, a lot of people focus on the pandemic as something very problematic for making these ethical choices, especially as an individual. But to one extent, I would actually like to, to, to flip that coin in a sense to say that I mean, whenever in history has it been so easy to be moral hero, you're supposed to stay home, watch TV and drink beer, and that's what you need to do. So, so, so to, to some extent, I mean, the pandemic has really made it possible for us to do these uh, morally uh, commanding things. However, though, of course, there is other kinds of deliberations also, uh, such as um, the trade-offs between our individual rights on the one hand and then our civic duties on the other. So, I mean, how do we find a balance there? We call these ethical dilemmas for a reason because there's no easy answer to these questions. Uh, and I think Sweden also, being Swedish, of course, our national strategy has been one of those things which has shown up a lot in the media, for instance, since we have had a rather uh, open uh, strategy in comparison to many other countries. We haven't had a complete lockdown. You could still go to a restaurant even if they haven't served any alcohol after 8.30 in the evening, you know. Uh, so, so, so we had a lot of liberty. Um, and of course, that was due to other kind of deliberation. So how do we, on the one hand, weigh saving lives right now? That is those being uh, infected by, by COVID on the one hand. But how do we also think about uh, the economy? Uh, on the other hand, how do we save the economy? How do we think about the long-term impact? What would be the consequences of complete lockdown, keeping children home from school, and so on and so forth? So once again, I think that reiterates again that the murky waters we're really trying to navigate here, and we don't have the luxuries, as, as Lao Tzu suggested, you know, to wait until all those sediments go to the bottom and we hear a clear sight. We don't have that privilege right Right now, we need to take action in uncertainty. And I think that is one of the biggest challenges of the pandemic right now. Very well said. Thank you. And, uh, you know, about the economics, uh, Veronica, I mean, Sweden on balance is a fairly well off country compared to many. And we know that uh, the middle classes and the lower middle classes have been severely impacted by lockdowns. People who can least afford to be out of work have been forced to be out of work, often without very much governmental recompense. Uh, and we've seen, of course, the eternal problem of disparity of wealth growing much, much sharper uh, over the last 12 months. So, so there are also factors here about ethics, not just as an individual concern about what you or I should do, about a, a larger concern from a humane standpoint, uh, how are uh, the people most affected by this going to be helped? And no one person can do that. This obviously requires a collective effort of some kind. So uh, that's another topic, but this it seems to be where partly you are going. Nuno, I would turn things back to you now and ask you to comment, elaborate on what you've already said and or comment on what the other speakers have said, please. 
Thanks, Lou. I would like to comment on two points that were brought to the discussion by by my fellow panelists. And the first is the wonderful idea of having philosophers uh, working uh, with uh, with CEOs of companies or at least advising them. Um, I, I don't doubt that this can uh, actually be a reality in the near future. Uh, I'm sure that some companies uh, already have some some philosophers uh, at least advising them. But of course, I mean, uh, the the problems we face, uh, ecological uh, problems, uh, financial and so on, certainly will lead to, to this. But I would extend this idea, of course, to advising uh, not only companies, but also uh, government members. Uh, I think this will be crucial because... Uh, uh, of course, that um, an unethical uh, practices don't happen only in, in companies or are not only caused by by the activities of uh, of companies, uh, but they should um, clearly be be also uh, seen from the angle of the of our governments. And this leads me to the to the second point, uh, which was raised by Tom, and uh, I was uh, really delighted. Uh, to hear him talking about uh, Plato uh, and Aristotle, and of course, I mean we we know that already in Plato's Republic we had uh, this this key insight of the philosopher King, um, and Tom was uh, suggesting that we should go to the streets and uh, trying to convince people that ethics is important, and um, uh, I absolutely agree that we, that we as philosophers should do that. But I think that um, in this case, uh, education plays a crucial role. I mean, we uh, uh, we are also, at least some of us here, we are also professors. Uh, we are we are teaching people. So, so in this sense, even though we do not uh, teach, for example, ethics as a subject, I'm, for example, teaching epistemology right now. But um, even so, I think that uh, there should be. Um, uh, an action guided by by ethical principles, and that we as philosophers can certainly uh, pass this on to the um, to the new generations, uh, uh, namely by by teaching them the um, the the main theories of the philosophical tradition, introducing them to these authors, and making them uh, think by themselves uh, about about this. I, I'm a Wittgensteinian, so. I, uh, I'm convinced that uh, that we are already in an ethical perspective. Uh, so, so more than teaching ethics, we need to be reminded uh, of uh, of what is important. Um, I mean, looking again at uh, at uh, at the world, trying to to look at uh, at it from a different angle, uh, and that certainly can be done by 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 philosophers. Thank you so much. It must be done by philosophers. But this happens at a time, as you well know, when the entire humanities are under siege, at least in the West, uh, are being really defunded in favor of STEM. And there's nothing wrong with STEM. But why not the best of both worlds? We're not going to inculcate moral compasses by throwing iPads at kindergarten children and assuming that they'll turn into ethical beings. It's not going to happen. Um, and we could look at some examples <laughs> of tech oligarchs for that. But now, Vana. Um, over to you. Please give us your view on, on, on what you've already said. Elaborate or indeed comment on the other speakers' contributions. Well, I wanted to, uh, to elaborate a bit on trust, on uh, the notion of corporate uh, social responsibility, and also uh, a little bit on technology. But let me start with uh, technology, because I think this connects with uh, some consensus that I'm hearing with all of you that, um, that traditional philosophy and traditional resources have a lot to contribute um, to these ethical dilemmas that we're confronting. But um, I'm not always happy with uh, Martin Heidegger's uh, very florid terminology and so on. I'm an analytic philosopher, but I do think his um, lectures on technology are worth uh, uh, another look because uh, as I understand uh, the thrust of Heidegger's point, Technology, in effect, uh, 
produces a kind of Weltanschauung that is imposed upon us, a kind of lens through which we look at everything. And there are other ways of looking at it, uh, non-technological ways. Technology forces us to look at people as replaceable, as, as simply a, a surplus uh, uh, reserves that we can use for certain things, a very instrumental view, which is counter to fostering humanity. So I think uh, the philosopher has a role uh, to uh, encourage, uh, as part of the ethics education in corporations, perhaps looking at other Weltanschauung, other points of view, the contemplative, uh, the uh, occurs to me the traditional Platonic, Aristotelian, Stoic points of view are all relevant to uh, uh, looking at things in new ways. I would also suggest that feminism is another way of looking at uh, uh, world, world problems, the global problems that we're confronting with technology. Um, turning now just very quickly to the question of trust, uh, which uh, Locke saw is, uh, yes, is very, is very fundamental. Um, it, uh, uh, we, I think we have practical trust. We have trust in corporations as competent and as willing to do things, but I think we need to foster what philosophers call ep epistemic trust. That is to say that the information that is disseminated from corporations is, uh, is indeed trustworthy. So I see I'm running out of time. So Thank you very much, Vaughn. That you've said a lot in a short time. Uh, epistemic trust speaks volumes. Uh, Tom, last and not least, if you could, we're running. We're, we're going to be closed down in four minutes, so I'm giving you three minutes, and then everyone gets fifteen seconds. Okay, for the takeaway, You're, it's yours, Tom. Uh, sounds you. good, Lou. Thanks. About fifteen years ago, I was having dinner with the leaders of perhaps the most famous investment bank in the world. The CEO who was sitting to my left turned to me at one point during the dinner and said, you know what, what keeps me up at night is the worry that one person in this organization is going to do something someday that brings down everything we've worked so long and hard to create. You know what? Ethics is about the individual, but it's also about those structures and practices and habits around the individual like the corporate culture, for example, that either enhance an ethical sensibility and propagate it through time or resist the ethical sensibility. For years, I've been talking about truth, beauty, goodness, and unity, the intellectual, aesthetic, moral, and spiritual domains and dimensions of our lives and how every company that wants sustainable success can only build a strong ethical culture by paying attention to truth, beauty, goodness, and unity each governing the other. So if we can, if we can use the structures and the practices around us and, and tweak those in a more positive direction, I think we can make the most of what we've learned during this pandemic about the necessity of trust, the importance of the virtues. And it's just a, a thrill to be a part of a panel like this where we see from different parts of the world, people representing different traditions coming to very confluent and convergent realizations about the utter importance of ethics for our time. Thank you so much. That's a seed which can be transplanted all over the world. If five philosophers can agree, then bigger organizations can agree. And go even governments could agree. Uh, but not as long as the pandemic is politicized and weaponized, all right? We need truth yeah. in, 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 in information and truth in investigation. All right, your takeaways, we're under a minute. Can you give us 10 seconds? Uh, Bala, what, what is your 10-second bumper sticker encapsulation? Yeah, that's interesting. Ethics can survive pandemic, right? That's what we are asking about. And uh, uh, obviously, what kind of ethics, if at all we are looking for uh, ethics to survive, what kind of ethics? Is it individual ethics? Is it communitarian ethics? Is it virtue ethics? Is it utilitarian one? Is it deontological one? Is it about human action or inaction? Or is it about as far as so far we have understood ethics to be an autopasis? So I would argue that what we are looking for is symbiotic ethics, okay, which is okay. self creation and also which is involved with other create other elements around it. Yeah. Thank you, Veronica. Ten seconds, please. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, Mission Impossible. Uh, 
Well, the pandemic, we focused a lot on some of the problems surrounding the pandemic. However, I also think there's opportunities there, even related to ethics. So one of the things I want to ask us is to think about not how we can go back to how life used to be, but to take this time out to think about what kind of futures we want to create. Let us go from what is to what if. Great. So we can we can bring willpower into this too. Let's not neglect that. Bruno, no, no. Please, your takeaway. Well, we definitely need a balance between ethics, uh, economics, uh, technology, and uh, without this balance, uh, and without seeing ethics as a fundamental part of our lives and of our societies, uh, actually, uh, progress can't be made. Thank you so much, Vana. Your takeaway, please. Uh, I think I like Veronica's future orientation a great deal. Um, 